Hello everyone and uh, welcome to this webinar today. This is one of our um, regular webinars, our Tuesday evening webinars that we do. And thank you all of you for, for joining us today. Um, this particular webinar, I'm Francis Seeley by the way, I'm sure many of you know, but just to let you know I'm from Global Net 21. Um, the, the topic we're going to deal with today is really around a theme that we've been dealing with for quite some time now and that is future democracy. And we've done quite a few um, webinars and events, including a House of Commons meeting, or at least one House of Commons meeting, more than that, on democracy. We've looked at how we can have a more deliberative democracy system in this country. We've looked at how we can develop conversations to do that. We've looked at democracy and civil society. Uh, and we've looked at uh, democracy and future technology. And those are all important topics that we're going to carry on throughout the year. But in this webinar, we're going to look specifically at the impact of the internet on um, democracy, on how wired up Britain and wired up the world, in fact, can impact on our democracy. The way in which it actually creates virtual communities, it brings people together from across the globe. It impacts on communities, on nations, on regions, and on the globe, and creates a different sort of um, uh, identity for people that actually brings the way we do democracy into question because it hasn't really caught up with the new social media and the internet. And Emma uh, McQueenie, who's going to present this, has done a lot of work on that. Uh, she's uh, well known in this area. Uh, she was rated, she's gonna blush now, as well as one in the top 10 people in technology by The Guardian in this country. Um, she, uh, was on the Commission on Digital Democracy that the Speaker of the House of Commons, John Burko, um, got together. So she's well known in this area and we're really pleased and privileged to have her here today. So I'm gonna hand over to Emma now, but before I do, just two things. One, this webinar will be recorded. And that means that I hope that I will have it up and recorded tomorrow and up on site. And all of you can then look at the recording of this and other people will be able to see it as well. And secondly, remember, as Emma is speaking, don't wait to put your top at your questions and your com comments on. Please do it as she speaks so we've got them ready when she's finished and we put those questions to you, as in fact we, we will do. So thank you for all joining. And Emma, I'm gonna hand over to you now. And thank you for joining us on this for what is a fascinating and interesting topic. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm gonna have to put my glasses on because I'm sitting very close to my screen. But um, this is one of my uh, favorite topics. Um, and it was a, a favorite topic of conversation before the speaker even phoned and asked me to, to join him on his Digital Democracy Commission. So just to give you a little bit of background on to um, how that happened and what it was, in case some of you don't know, he set this commission up um, at the beginning of 2015. Um, I was one of um, eight commissioners, I think. Um, and we were looking at um, the impact of the digital revolution on democracy um, and also how Parliament um, could use digital tools to, um, to better engage with people. So it kind of started from a relatively generic um, point of view, but very quickly, as you can imagine, um, the role of representative democracy in a digital age came up and, um, and that was fascinating. So um, I'm going to, um, I'm not going to do death by slides, however, I am going to share um, some slides with you just so that I can talk to them and it will um, help frame this conversation. But um, one thing that I think is very important to um, remember is that we are so early in this stage of, kind of you know, both the digital revolution and, and even really um, early in um, early, early in, in the way that um, parliament and government around the world is responding to this and um, industry and business has been much quicker to do so and parliaments and governments are, are trying to catch up. So um, I think <clears throat> the important thing to bear in mind whenever um, you, know, you, you engage with a webinar 
like this with me or anybody else who, who talks about them. These, these are kind of points of view for you to kind of take into your mind and to apply your knowledge and your understanding to, to kind of then further the conversation. And then, so I guess um, there would be an ask for me, which would be um, anything that is triggered you know, in you as a result of this webinar, that you continue that conversation and continue um, um, talking about this and perhaps writing about it in, in, you know, in your own way about what you think, because, you know, this is, this is a big problem. So this is what I'm going to be talking to you about. I'm talking to you about um, the digital revolution and specifically about borders and boundaries and how all of that works in the digital world. Now, I say that that's what I'm going to be talking to you about mainly, that's, but that's almost really my final slide. Um, so just to kind of give some context here, um, I was invited onto the Digital Democracy Commission in 2015, um, mainly because I had um, a lot of experience of working with young people. I, I ran um, an organization called Young Rewired State, where I got kids aged 18 and under um, engaged with open government data to try and find a new way to engage young people with the democratic process um, and um, and because of that I started to write um, about um, what this looked like for young people and the more I, I um, the more I worked with young people and talked to them about government and, and help them engage with um, the democratic process um, the more I started to see a big difference between um, those kids aged well born in 1997 or after and um, and I'll explain those kids on on the next slide but um, I started writing about um, these young people and their engagement and that attracted the attention of, of John Burke so he said please can you come and join this commission and I specifically want you to focus on young people and um, and democracy and so I was, of course, involved in, in kind of all of it, but I, I um, spent the majority of 2015 um, working with groups of young people and just looking at, um, looking at the way that they engaged with government now and then how, um, how they might want to engage in the future. And um, a little anecdote for you. Um, I remember two times where almost the exact session could have been replicated. So we, um, we got a group of <clears throat> sixth form students together from the same college, two separate occasions, and, um, and we asked them, so excuse me, <clears throat> we asked them if they voted or if they planned to vote in the general election. And, um, and almost to a person, they were completely disengaged. They were just like, no, we don't care about the general election. We don't know how to vote, um, blah, blah, blah. And, um, and so that was fine. So they were kind of fairly, fairly disengaged in, in the first instance. And you think, right, this is going to be a really long day. <laughs> um, and then you start, started getting them into, we started getting them into groups, talking about issues, talking about um, things that meant something to them. So um, we asked them to talk about a piece of news that chimed with them or, you know, just to, just to get the discussion going. And very quickly, as is their wont, generally speaking, teenagers, they became, you know, extremely um, opinionated and, and energized um, all at the same time. The noise and the energy in the room kind of goes right up and you just think, right, okay, fine. So, you know, they, they really do um, care about these, they really care about, issues that matter to them. I know that sounds like a really obvious statement, but it's just, you have to kind of, um, I think it's just kind of actually having that thrown in your face when you see these kind of groups of people. Now they'll be talking about Trump, then they were talking about Obama, they were talking about FGM, they were, they, you know, they were, they were talking about, um, you know, things in the news that they were finding out about because of social media. Animated about things that mattered to them. But, um, but obviously they felt that um, the MPs didn't represent them. They definitely didn't feel represented. They felt alienated by it. They might have gone to the Houses of Parliament as a school tour, but they certainly didn't see that as something, you know, where, where their voice was heard. And, um, and, you know, again, no great surprise there, really. But, um, but what was a surprise was um, how passionate they were about... Um, um, 
referendum really about how or referenda um, about how um, if you debated a topic or they were allowed to vote on a topic they were up for that they really wanted that so they they really wanted to be able to engage with the petitions process for example and out of both um, both groups of young people one of the recommendations that they had to go back to John Burko that weren't actioned but um, um, were um, certainly taken back into the commission was that the um, the e-petition site was limited to young people who couldn't vote. So these young people that we were talking to disengaged with politics but um, animated about topics and then um, we introduced them all to um, a variety of apps that allowed them to answer a number of questions and at the end of those questions they would be told which political party they were most affiliated to. I don't know if any of you have seen these apps but um, you know, they, they will never say, you are fully conservative, you are um, fully Labour, you are fully Green Party or whatever. They will always say, you know, this percent and this percent and this percent. So they could, they could already see that they were made up of, um, of multiple beliefs. And, um, but absolutely loved the fact that within five minutes, they had the answers, the answer to which party they should vote for. And so they had a gang, right? And, um, and by the time you get to the afternoon, this happened in both occasions, by the time you got to the afternoon, you had the Conservative table, you had the Labour table, you had the, uh, the Green Party table, you had the Scottish National Party table, you had, you know, these, these kids were just like um, already kind of separating themselves out in, into tribes <clears throat> and wanting to look at what the manifestos were, <clears throat> wanting to understand um, who their party leader was, you know, because a lot of them didn't know. And, um, and it happened to be that the next night of the first um, occasion we ran this, the next night was a political debate on television and, um, and they couldn't wait. And I mean, the, the, the amazing thing for me, I think, was the transformation of those children from, from the morning when they were just like, oh, please, can we just go um, to the afternoon when they were um, where they were desperately trying to, you know, setting reminders in their phone to make sure that they could um, watch their, their party leader um, debating. And, um, and so I think for me, there was a great sign there that actually this apathy that people talk about, the political apathy that, that young people have, or that even everyone has at the moment, isn't true. There is just a disconnect. And so it's a very complicated disconnect. Um, but just by sort of drawing on some of those threads, um, I think we're sort of starting to, starting to kind of at least see what the problem is. And then obviously once we can see um, the problem, it's easier to, to actually address that and come up with, you know, multiple solutions. But these problems are big. So um, obviously with, uh, with voting, you know, just um, voting by referendum um, is messy. It's not going to work. And, and it's expensive and it's complicated. And, and I, you know, that, that, isn't, that isn't the answer, even though they see that that is the answer. Um, but, um, but I think that the answer does lie somewhere between the two. And I'll come on to some of the solutions that, um, that, that people have, um, have promoted that I've come across in, in my travels, um, which can be debated. Um, so just coming on to these these 97 is so that you have a full picture of um, what I mean. Um, 97 is our kids born in 1997 and after, and it represents that entire generation and, and all who come after them. And the biggest difference between um, them and everybody else that went before them is that they grew up with social media. That means that they know no different. Um, which means that, yes, they've had access to um, news and media sites earlier. Um, you know, those that shouldn't be on social media are on social media and, um, and those that are, are on social media will share with their friends. So they, they actually um, have access to news um, a lot earlier in their lives. And, um, and they also suffer from um, the you know, the kind of echo chamber that, um, that social media can create as soon as it starts realizing um, your political leanings, even if you don't, you know, they just, they just kind of hear this, this echo chamber um, back to them. But more importantly, I think, is, is the community. And this is where I'll come to later with, um, with borders and geography. Um, but I've been talking about these kids for a long time. Um, the 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 um, the relevance, really, I think, to to this talk, the the kind of four points about them that I think that are relevant here, 
um, are that they are um, relentless researchers. So they're relentless researchers, um, not um, because they're they're all um, wanting to be a super academic. Um, it's not. It's just that they actually get more attention if they prove someone wrong um, than if they prove someone right. So um, it's all very well putting something out there that everybody agrees with and getting lots of thumbs up. But um, but if you actually prove someone wrong and um, and you find the evidence for that and you share the evidence for that, well, you know, you may be viral tomorrow. You know, you may be in the news. You, you know, that's where you get the most attention. And um, ever since teenagers were born, um, they love a little bit of attention. Um, so the relentless researching is actually driven by ego, but I think that that is, um, that is something that is inherent in their nature. And increasingly with um, the attention paid to fake news, obviously, um, the veracity of content that they're sharing is important to them. Um, and they're huge influencers. And they're influencers simply because um, they have grown up um, with all of these communities, whether that's a community of, of three or five or 10 or 50 or 100, and multiple, you know, they're leaders in some communities and, and there'll be followers in others. So they might know how to make a smoky eye um, or they might know how to bake an incredible chocolate cake or put this particular piece of Lego together. Um, but they also just might be very interested in how to knit a green frog. So they'll be in that community as well. So they're kind of quite happy um, playing different roles in communities. But what they do know is how to influence, because if you can imagine growing up and, um, and then you know, saying something and then immediately seeing how that went down with your audience, um, so whether people agreed with what you were saying or whether people didn't agree with what you were saying, and they get this immediate feedback. So they're either, um, you know, either their content is liked or it's shared, um, or it's not liked or it's not shared and it's just ignored. And then they know that their message that they wanted to get across wasn't, wasn't, um, wasn't put across properly. So they know to change their message slightly and then, you know, get that hook. Um, that feedback of the likes and the shares and so this kind of um, this this influencing is is kind of right in, in the heart of them and we've had to learn it adopt it um, to them it's just completely natural and so you know it's, it used to be an insane talent that anybody would be able to walk into a room and read it and um, and in the digital space these kids can walk into a digital room and they can read it immediately and what more uh, does a politician need than to be able to say what the room wants to hear? They're tribal. Um, obviously, they're tribal. I, I think that young people are tribal anyway, but um, never has it been easier to, to be a tribe than, um, than, than on the internet. And um, members of, of um, multiple communities um, that have no bearing on where they live. Um, it's what they care about, what the topic of that tribe um, might be. And, um, and they can change identity. So it's just like traveling, but you're just doing it, you know, online. And, um, and the, the tribal element of it, I think, is going to be very interesting for us to see as they, um, as they uh, specifically the ones that are kind of at the, at the forefront of this, so the 97ers who are now 19, 20 years old, as they leave university and, um, and, and go into work and start to have children and, and go and become the policemen and the politicians and teachers and uh, plumbers and what, you know, whatever, you know, the, how they're going to take their tribes with them. Um, and I think that's going, I think the first evidence of that is actually being seen already with these famous YouTubers um, who have millions and millions and millions of followers um, and are already influencing their tribes. When they become parents, when they, um, you have to excuse my dog in the background, when they become parents and when they um, are trying to tackle issues that are more important than what they might be trying to tackle now, for example, um, how their tribe will follow them and, and then how that will impact on the politics of the day. And I, and, um, and I think that would be very interesting in the next 10 years. And the multicultural global citizens um, is, is a, as a, bit of a no-brainer. I mean, you know, the internet has no borders and boundaries, no sea, and, um, and people might fight over territory, but, um, but that's not land. And, um, and these children um, that, that were born into social media really do see themselves as a part of a global community facing global problems, um, less so 
than um, you know what, whatever might be happening in their in their road, their street, their town, their village, their school, or whatever. So that's the background of of young people, and this is kind of you know one of the one of the ways to which I approach um, this kind of effect of um, the digital revolution on um, democracy. Now, um, this I just need to move myself out of the way. Um, <clears throat> this. I I don't know um, if Ed um, Dowding is watching, um, but he runs an organisation called Represent Me and was very active um, in the commission and um, is you know has set up a, um, a an organisation called Represent Me and um, and we we spoke often and um, and I'm just I'm I had to kind of you know thank him in here because I I have paraphrased paraphrased a lot of what he says here but um, I mean it's true so most people will say that no single party represents their wishes and I think that's all, always been true since the beginning of time but as those apps show us actually no party will ever you know actually match everything that you believe in and, and it will always be a certain percentage of um, this party and a, and a certain percentage of that party. And so that does bring into question whether, um, whether even the political party system um, you know, is going to survive the next hundred years. Um, and the, this, this kind of, you know, this, this huge separation of left and right, um, and this isn't obviously restricted to young people here, but, um, but, you know, we're kind of moving ever closer to this kind of, you know, this, this centre ground. And I think we've seen that in politics, certainly in the UK, um, you know, over recent years, actually, you know, everybody is violently agreeing, but desperately fighting to, to disagree. And, um, and I think that there's a, you know, yes, of course, you know, in, in America at the moment, we're, we're seeing that, that trend being bucked, but I'll come on to that a bit later in this, in this um, in this slide, but um, but this is not necessarily a good thing um, because you know any of you that that like your Plato or like to kind of go back to the beginning of, of democracy um, when democracy starts to th to fail, then dictators thrive, and that's what we're seeing. I mean, there there is always a swing from dictatorship to democracy, and then back again. And I think we're certainly at the you know, at the kind of uppermost, hopefully, um, of that of that swing into dictatorship before you know something happens, usually a war, and then you, you you swing back into true democracy again. So I think that we have a couple of things at play here that aren't you know, and that might not necessarily be the fault of um, of the digital revolution. Although I think it's certainly been escalated by the by the digital revolution just because of <clears throat> the community and the communication that that it allows. Um, that the digital space allows. So um, therefore, that that kind of makes it a bit harder for um, you know governments to rule through PR, shall we say? <laughs> you know, people actually want you to um, to prove what you say and to do what you say you're going to do. And if you don't do it, they will hold you to account. And um, and increasingly, that means that the MP, the representative, becomes um, ever more irrelevant um i i thought i thought this fact that um that he he brings up in conversation a lot and is always kind of stuck in my mind um but i do have to credit him with it is because i just never thought of that is that actually you know under the under the current rules you only get to you know an average of, of 14 chances to actually vote in a general election and um and i think that to uh, these, you know, young people, these 97ers in particular, but increasingly to ourselves, who are who are obviously being impacted by um, the way that we communicate with each other and the way that we engage and, and um, belong to our own communities, not just um, the young people. It does feel that that it does feel that you know that they don't really mean that they want to listen to you, that they don't really um, want to hear what you have to say. Um, when it's so restricted like this, and um, and and so I think you know the the, the kind of Trump phenomena, which um, which I think is is referred to, or well, that I'm referring to here in in my point four, even though I mentioned Trump in point five, um, 
is that you know we you know we're we're having all of these companies thrown in our face and companies but also personalities you know this kind of you know this hugely um consumerist you know life laid bare um people becoming famous for two years and you know their lives being transformed and and um and people just starting businesses in their homes which is you know that's not only because of the digital revolution that's also because of um the recession you know that so necessity is kind of bringing these things around so it's a kind of huge perfect storm happening here um but that kind of um that ju juxtaposition of um people being able to be entrepreneurs and to be able to kind of create a company and uh, you know accumulate huge amounts of wealth if that's what you want to do um they can do that within five years but you can't change government and um and you can't change your mind and you can't go back on a decision so it just doesn't make sense, but it feels too big and um, the infrastructure um, feels too broken. Um, and it, it kind of feels like there's just no way out of this, the way that we've got it happening at the moment. And, and so um, the, the final point about Trump is that, you know, I think he is a bit of a, you know, a war cry from America to just kind of say, look, we don't feel like our voice is, is is being heard. We don't feel represented. And so I don't know what the alternative is, but there's this guy. And um, and I, I listened to a, um, a radio discussion over the bank holiday where um, this chap was talking about his mum and um, it was an American guy. And, you know, he said, my mum didn't vote for... Trump because she really believed in him, but she she voted for him because she just really hated Hillary Clinton, and um, and he said, but since then, um, it, since since Trump's come into power, she's been caught up in this huge kind of frenzy of um, noise and energy, and you know this is the truth. I am talking to you, and so this you know this platform um, is enabling her to hear what she wants to hear. Um, regardless of whether it's the truth or not, we're not getting into a Trump argument here. But part so this this kind of disconnect and this and this and this broken um, this kind of broken system that doesn't quite sit comfortably on top of the um, digital revolution is um, the 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 symptoms <laughs> are there that this is broken and um, and so I think that there's a, a symptom of of um, broken infrastructure as well as a symptom of this swing of um, uh, of, of democracy um, to, to tyranny, and um, and so it's you know if you, if you so I think if you can kind of put all of those things together, there's this group of young people who you know have grown up in this digital space where borders and boundaries don't really make sense, and um, and they're kind of learning and sharing and influencing early and getting engaged early. Um, you know, alongside this kind of slightly broken infrastructure that is that is kind of you know causing democracy to to break and um, and throw up um, dictators, um, and then also um, the fact that um, you know through necessity because of the um, um, because of the recession, um, people are. Uh, creating businesses and um, are becoming successful and maybe those businesses are dying I don't know but you know within that life cycle of a, of a business is far quicker than life cycle of a government and um, and it feels completely out of pace with the rest of us so hang on where's my next slide here we go um, so there was one um, there was one conversation that I had that has also stuck in my mind to this girl in um, Canada last year. And, um, and I was talking to her about the work that um, we'd done the year before in, in um, the Democracy Commission. And, um, and in Canada, um, in, in her area, they were um, trialing, um, a, um, trialing this kind of you know, way of ruling by referendum where um, they were paying people in the same way that you would pay a jury. So they were paying people to come together um, giving them education, giving them enough knowledge that they had in order to make decisions, and um, and then asking those people to come up with a decision that um, 
that was based on knowledge, but also they were voted into that. They were kind of, they were, take, they weren't voted into that jury, that's wrong. They were, they were chosen to represent the community. Um, and that way people felt that they were engaging far better and it meant that people were making informed decisions on behalf of the community. And so um, what was interesting about that was that was happening at the same time as Brexit, where people were making um, decisions based on what they might have heard down the pub not all people, obviously, but the majority of people were not getting the information that they might have needed in order to make such an inf important decision. And, um, and so there were many debates um, with this lady afterwards um, it, when we were in New York, so not here, unfortunately, um, about how this, this might work for Brexit. And I think it's an interesting concept um, and, um, and one that I suspect in time um, we might be able to look at. I think that um, representative democracy, again, um, is an issue in as much as, you know, it was, it was kind of built for a, an age that kind of no longer exists, right? You know, where a man would jump on a horse and ride to Parliament with the wishes of the people and then um, would bring back the news from Parliament back to the people. And, and those days are, are long gone. Um, and the printing press changed everything. And now the algorithm really um, does change things and um, and so I think that the the questions that I, I, I think sort of resound around this is you know how how can a person who happens to live um, down the road from you be a representative in all, in all that you you care about um, and I say so that's certainly you know where I live you know I, the, the person that, that represents me even for the party that I vote for um, you know, there's is only probably about 20% of the stuff that I care about. And, um, and when we, the MPs that were involved in the commission, for example, um, if they were talking about something that they knew a lot about or they cared about um, on Twitter um, or were asked a, an opinion or a question, they would have to check first that those people were in their constituency before they could reply or respond, which is just bonkers. That just doesn't, you know, that, that can't possibly be... <laughs> um, that can't possibly be a good way of, of doing this. So, you know, that kind of geographical, because this bloke lives near me, or this woman um, lives near me, that they're going to, to, um, to represent me and represent what I care about in, in all things, you know, maybe, okay, you know, it might be about my local park, but, um, but actually then they don't represent me in, um, in the majority of areas. So, so really thinking about that, the kind of geographical boundaries and representative democracy is something that just, I, I, you know, it, it, it goes round and round in my head. I don't know what the solution is because I see these communities of people with these community leaders online um, who are not MPs. And if they were an MP, they would only be able to represent their local area. Um, then I, I don't know what the answer is to that, but I, I, you know, I think it's a huge challenge for us. Okay, well, that, that's great. Well, thanks a lot. I mean, you raised a lot of interesting questions there and a lot of points and some questions are already uh, coming up now. I mean, you mentioned, um, you mentioned what was happening in Canada. And in fact, we did a webinar with Perry Walker, who did a lot of research about the citizens' juries in Canada. And he's, right, trying, right. he's not trying to replicate that now in this country in relation to Brexit Excellent. in the way that you said, which is right. quite interesting. Right. And um, you know, I, I think David New Newman asked that question. He said, the trouble with social media, you're getting feed immediate feedback. You have this drop-in, drop-out culture all the time. How can you translate that into a more deliberative approach? How can you combine social media with deliberation? Um, and is that one way that you've looked at or have you found other ways as well? Yeah, but I, I think, you see, I think that it's in the same way that this challenges education, right? So... Um, so in order for um, teachers to engage with children rather than the teacher having all of the knowledge in them and then imparting that knowledge to the children increasingly, you know, it's, you know, kind of having to adopt the flip classroom mentality where they go out and they find this information and come back. I think that having, um, by the way, I really don't agree with, with ruling by referenda, but I think by having an opportunity for people to be able to learn and to kind of set that breadcrumb trail so that they, if they wanted to follow, if they wanted to research, they wanted to find out that they would then be able to make an informed decision, that they would be able to do so. And I think that you could look at the communities, you can look at the multiple communities that are out there and pick those community leaders who've, who've um, been 
you know, been elected a community leader just by default, by being the most knowledgeable person in that community anyway. So those should be the ones that, that um, are asked to represent people that really care about that particular issue. Okay, and David Wood raises questions. He says, right, are the 1997ers really that different because people of his generation, indeed my generation, believe it or not, are also sort of trying to be influencers. We can be tribal. We can do all the things that you talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, and he says, well, isn't that true of other generations? But then he raises another point that maybe the 1970s are slightly different in the sense that um, in terms of the global uh, culture that we're in they are you know people from anywhere rather than people from somewhere as David Goodhart says in his book is that a basic difference between that generation and us we may be researchers we may want to be influencers but we don't have that nomad sort of uh, feeling that maybe younger people have today I mean partly I mean you know, the, the, I think the big, you know, with the influencers, to be able to find out in real time how your message has gone across from age 13, you know, so you're saying something and then you're immediately getting a hit or you're immediately, you know, actually crashing out. To, to, and then that's how you grow up. So that's how you, you know, your kind of formative teenage years are spent you know, in these communities, in these forums, doing, getting this approval, getting this and learning how to, to change your message. We never had that. Um, access to news, unless, you know, when we were growing up, we were listening to the radio and reading the newspaper and, um, or maybe even watching TV. I'm quite old. But, you know, the, the um, you know, unless you were actually watching those news pro programs, that news was not made available to you in a way that you were going to consume it in the way that, that young people consume today. So, yes, you know, all teenagers since the beginning of time, you know, have, have um, you know, are opinionated and, um, you know, do want to do stuff and, you know, are kind of very valiant about lots of things. But the, the, the specific difference about growing up with social media, yes, it's the connectivity. It's the fact that, you know, these borders don't matter and they can immediately communicate and they can immediately be a part of the community. But the influence is, is, is really key. And the fact that they can just find out that, you know, they can, without having to go to a bank of Encyclopedia Britannicas, you know, it's anybody can go and research and find the truth about something. Do you think also that... Um... Uh, because they, they they do this and they do it automatically, they've been brought up with it. It changes the way they think. They think differently to the way we did. They don't think in an analog way. They think in, in sort of an impressionistic way and they put things together in their minds in a different way. They're different wave patterns and that affects the way they look at politics as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, there is, a, you know, there is a lot of, um, there is a lot of research into this at the moment. There is a lot of research as because these kids are, you know, they're 19, 20 years old. So we don't, you know, we're not kind of seeing that the full effect um, of this, but it is certainly, um, it's certainly changing their attitudes towards their own influence and their own power. And that's not only down to, that's not only down to the digital revolution. This is also down to the recession because the recession happening at the same time meant that um, they saw a lot of you know kind of, you know institutions and jobs um, crumble around them and so everybody was kind of you know having to create something new and they and they they were right at the coal face of that as well so so they don't have that security um, and um, and so it's you know it's kind of you know in a in a weird way it's kind of like they they grew up you know, in a war, but it's just a war that we didn't see. <laughs> also, David Wood raises an interesting sort of traditional question as well, and that is the disengagement you talk about, is that more of a structural problem than an existential one? For example, if you changed our system to PR, had larger constituencies or changed structures in one way or the other, you would encourage more engagement. It's not about social media, it's more about the structures of representative democracy. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's everything. This is the problem. Is I think it's it's certainly not social media. Um, so you know, social media is not the answer. Social media has kind of created the problem in them. I think, um, and I don't think changing the the structure necess necessarily is going to help. I mean, you know, we have to think of this as a, you know, 
we have to look at this as a global thing, right? Okay, so there's, you know, there, there are global problems that, that we all care about. So, you know, how, um, how everybody in the world um, might feel about, I don't know, um, the Paris Accord or how, you know, however they might, they might feel about something that absolutely affects everybody is something that I, I, I think we need to find a way for um, voices to be heard on a global scale as well as on a local scale and, um, and engaging with parliament. It's a difficult and it's a tricky thing. And I think it's going to be a combination of um, having representatives represent you in parliament. So finding a way of, of actually utis utilizing those who represent a group of people and utilizing those in parliament um, without kind of making the role of an MP completely defunct. I think, you know, that it just, you know, the, the roles and responsibilities of everybody that's involved in, in, um, in representative democracy at the moment just needs a good old shake up and i think if you started there you won't go far wrong yeah but how do we do that i mean david newman asked that question i mean how will parliament change because of the social media he's, he's he talks about for example how can we get mps to listen to young people through youth parliaments and youth forums we do lots of meetings in the house of commons we have some fantastic mps who are great at engaging but we have a lot of mps who come to a meeting to grandstand talk and they often leave yeah. they're not interested yeah. in engaging they're not interested well. in listening how can we use yes. social media i mean we're trying ways of doing that we've got some ideas around that but mm -hmm. what are your ideas about how we can make westminster change that reflects a new social media reality um i mean obviously we kind of you know this is this is one of the questions that we this is one of the thing that we talked about the most in in 2015 and um, there are some people who are there who are never going to change. This is an interim problem. We have to accept that this is an interim problem. By the time we've got, you know, in 20 years time, by the time all of the politicians that, that are actually kind of in there being MPs and stuff have kind of lived through a different age to, to the others, that we'll be asking a different set of questions. By the time the Secretary of State for Education um, or, the Minister of, or the Minister of Defence is, you know, is a, is a 97 er for example, that, you know, the, the, the conversation will be very different. And if you look back in history, this will be just such a tiny squeeze in time. You know, it's, it's kind of, you, you, so, the, you know, the, the answer to that is either you deal with this interim problem by being, you know, quite strict about engagement. So kind of actually enforcing engagement to make sure that um, people are, are listening to their representatives in the communities. You've got to look at those borders and boundaries. You've got to look at how, you know, MPs are, are representing their physical um, geography. I mean, that that is something that, you know, you can't, it's not easy, but it's something that you can change. So did you tell that to John Burko and how did he respond? <laughs> Um, yeah, we all we all had this conversation for about the last six months of, of 2015, um, and um, I think I think the primary cry at that point is that we must have online voting, <laughs> which which um, doesn't solve any problems at all. Um, but no, he's um, he was aware that it was a that, that it was a kind of you know a longer term thing, and I, I'm going when um, Parliament resumes, I'm going back in to go and speak to him again. Um, because I think what was obvious by the end of the year was that all we'd done at the beginning was just kind of peel, um, you know, peel back the lid of this thing and that, you know, this was extremely hard. And, um, you know, I have to say, you know, there was there was one paper, as in one of the papers that was going to be um, published, um, our report, and, um, and the cover note on it, the first sentence was, um, you know, the, the commission has been doing this. Um, and one thing that they're pleased to report is that it doesn't threaten representative democracy. And every single one of the commissioners was just like that sentence has to come out. Okay. Um, David, David Wood says, uh, you know, you mentioned about the global nature of social media and how people create new identities or multiple identities. Uh -huh. um, have you any examples from your own research of that having a, uh, uh, a, a, an effect on politics in any way that people can cooperate across the globe? Um, I think um, not necessarily in politics, but if you if put policy, yes. Um, so if you if you think about what happened with um, with education, and you you think about what happened with the um, MOOCs and with 
um, Khan Academy and with this, you know, the huge kind of, you know, sudden realization that we needed to have an awful lot more um, digital skills. And that kind of became a worldwide cry because actually the pain was being felt by every single community um, in every single country. It was something that kind of caught everybody by surprise, really. And, um, and so I think from a from social media actually sort of being the platform that enabled something to affect um, policy and government as opposed to parliament. Um, I think that education was, was the first one. Parliament, no. I think Estonia, obviously, you know, it's, it's a small country. It's able to, to, you know, to kind of pivot very quickly. But even they um, struggle with, um, with the, you know, the, the concept of representative democracy. Okay, I mean, again, David asks, and it's a really interesting question. I mean, you've talked about online democracy, for example, direct democracy, voting online, uh, the fact that young people want petitions and some sort of plebiscite type of arrangement. But he's saying, isn't it better to try and get people to discuss and come to consensus online? Now, there are some sites that do that, aren't there? Like Lumio, for example, which tries to do that, and that came from New Zealand. Mm -hmm. There's a site in Spain called Quorum, a site called Tremor and we're working with them to try and set up an MPs page where we can get MPs to talk to each other not only in this country but between different countries and with communities now if we can get those discussion going and we can get MPs to engage in those is that a, a, a better way forward than having instant knee-jerk reaction direct democracy referenda Anything is better than knee-jerk reaction is to a democracy <laughs> referenda. Um, yes, yes, um, I do think that's a good idea. That, that, um, so Represent Me, was. I sound like I, I work for Represent Me, I don't at all, but, um, but they, they're probably the closest thing in this country that I've seen to kind of, you know, get people to actually really consider um, a topic and to, and to come to some form of agreement and then to kind of propose a solution rather than um, everybody endlessly kind of sending a million emails into their MP saying they, they don't want something. Um, and I, I think the problem is, is that all of these things are happening, you know, like these tools are created um, because they're trying to get around a problem. Do you get me? So like if you work in a you know, if you, if you work in an office and everybody starts disobeying the rules because there are just too many friggin' rules and so they, you know, they're trying to find every single way they can get around it and still do their job and comply. And, um, and so I think that, um, you know, all of these things that are just bringing up all over the place are, are, are a symptom. And yes, something like that needs to happen, but something like that needs to be driven by parliament. It shouldn't be something that's just put together by um, either small business or by um, lobbying groups or by groups of volunteers. This is something that Parliament needs to take seriously. But it's very difficult, isn't it, to get those deliberative online channels to have traction? Yeah, yeah. But they don't necessarily, I mean, I think that if you have, if you have multiple channels into Let's say the hazards apartment. Okay, so you know the the horse the, the the horses that I was talking about before that were just kind of going backwards and forwards. If you have multiple channels in, and so long as Parliament has a way of kind of sifting those things, so you've got traditional channels, you've got the people who will represent you, even though I I don't think you can have geographical representation anymore. It doesn't make sense. Well, it won't make sense in ten years' time. And. Um, and then if you've got, you know, you've got, you've got a pocket of opinion that's happening in e-petitions and that's based on people just lobbying or whatever, but then you, you also have the lobbyists. But then if you have this other um, way of engaging with communities that I know what happens with the commission, so commissions will go out and will go and find um, communities of nurses or they'll go and find, you know, communities of people who, um, who are... Um, you know, kind of you know, leaders in their field and are relevant to, to, the, to the topic of conversation. But they're kind of, they go out there and they'll seek them and then, the, and then they'll get their opinion in through the kind of old traditional ways of, of doing that. And so you've got to kind of lower the barrier to actually making your voice heard. But you've also got to enable that kind of, you know, the, the gap of people who actually have the knowledge and do have the research and do have the insight, but don't have the time to be able to kind of lob this over a wall or that there is a paid representative um, from that group. So instead of the, 
you know, the paid members of parliament just being paid because of where they live. You know, if the members of, of parliament are paid because of the communities that they represent online um, and their digital um, geograph geographic space, if you like, then, you know, that I think that's where you start to, um, I think that's where you start to actually find the, the solution to this rather than just trying to constantly treat the symptoms. Yeah, I mean, David says we should perhaps work more closely with Ed Dowding and represent uh, me and see if we can develop things, in, you know, with him and the networks that he has and we have. Yeah, I mean, it was, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm, I certainly don't want to kind of necessarily ram them down your throat, but from all of the people that engaged with us on the, on the commission, it was a very interesting um, way to, to engage with people. It's, I mean, it's definitely worth looking at, definitely worth looking at, but um but, you know, as I said, you know, that people like him and his organization are kind of there because of because something's broken. And so it's not easy. And I, I you know, I certainly don't have have the answers, but um, but we have to just kind of keep asking these questions and, you know, being proved wrong. Like, you know, I'm, I'm 100 percent happy to be proved wrong all the time. But um, but there's just, you know, every time you kind of peel back a layer, it's just um We've got to kind of we've got to attack this from both ends. We've got to we've got to find the solutions to the immediate problem, and then we've also got to really try and try and get to the bottom of this. I mean, John John Harmon raises a, a really sort of sixty four thousand thousand dollar question. He says, in our slow movement towards digital democracy, have we allowed digital autocracy to take over? In other words, is the is I guess what he means is social media gradually being controlled by the major companies like Google and Facebook, the way we think, the way we behave, and that deliberative discussion is actually. Uh, influence like Cambridge Analytics and the Brexit debate and so on and their whole whole issues mm -hmm. around that. So mm -hmm. are we facing a real problem there that social media is not going to be as open as we would like it to be? Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. But again, I think that this is an interim problem. Um, so I think for um, for for the time being, you know, the kind of you know the the um, the blinkers have been removed from our eyes and um, and we're all aware that we are stuck in, in an echo chamber, we are stuck in a bubble that we're only actually seeing on social media, we're only actually seeing people who agree with us. Um, and I think that um, there, there is another difference, I'm afraid, between us and 97ers because, um, because they exist on so many platforms because they're trying to get away from their parents and they're very careful about what they share online. Um, they're not so easily categorized and um, and they they move from platform to platform, and they you know they're kind of you know they they leave all of their rubbish behind them in the same way that they leave their dirty bedrooms. You know they leave all their rubbish behind them, but they create you know their their kind of new persona on their new platform. So so actually they they kind of break out of the echo chamber that way. For us, I, for sure, a hundred percent, we are um, in you know the the people that kind of you know decide who you know who's winning and, and losing elections at the moment is already proven i think to to be zuckerberg and much less horror um in america but um but I, I i mean john i i don't know i don't know the solution to that although i think the solution to that is probably um but you know it's probably beyond the remit of this conversation but i think it's it comes from um their business model um data people owning their own data and therefore not allowing these people to data mine in the way they are or at least they pay you to data mine them um, and I also think that, you know, the development of, of AI based on data is, is going to break their business model because their business model um, is what drives their ability to be able to create this bubble around us. So, you know, we can kind of, it's definitely a threat um, and it's definitely something that will break it. I completely agree. Um, but I also think that, that you know, their, their way of working is also under threat at the moment, but, but we do need to be very, very careful. Michelle is worried about the fact that uh, because of the way social media has grown, there's a huge amount of fake information out there, and the 1970s have grown up in that. Now, does that mean that they're influenced by fake news? They, they, they find it difficult to be able to dis distinguish. Or do you think they're a savvy, a savvy generation and they they're know what is that? 
they're more savvy than us honestly they they can smell a rap for anybody else but like i said you know like i said at the beginning this isn't driven by the fact that they're all um you know wanting to be academics it's um it's because they get more attention by proving someone wrong um than than just by liking and sharing something so um so it's driven by ego and um you know I, i'm sure john will agree with me you know the the kind of you know the the dawn of the um digital revolution kind of birthed a whole load of narcissists so, so anything that, that speaks to the ego is that you know is going to be a winner but that is you know that that is good news from um from a fake news point of view because um they just assume everything is wrong because you know if they if they carry on looking and they find the truth then um that's going to get them more like yeah, doing these webinars make me feel makes me feel a bit of a narcissist at times. So I know what you mean. <laughs> um, but um, and I'm, at my age too, it's terrible. Um, but uh, one thing we haven't talked about the day David Newman has mentioned, and this is a, a whole webinar on its own. Really, we haven't talked mm. about local democracy and social media, right. and the right. way. And he talks about you know comparative uh, uh, analysis between different countries and what's happened in Chile and so mm. on, and the mm. growth of town hall meetings and digital. Town Town hall meetings which are developing as well. Mm. Do you think that's a healthy development and something that we could see develop further? Well, I can't talk from experience about Chile. I mean, I what I have seen though, so anecdotally, um, what I have seen is a lot more local activity. So, you know, look at what happened around Grenfell. You know, I know, you know, in, in my local area, people are looking for town halls. They're, they're looking for physical spaces to go. And I think that I don't think it would surprise anybody really to, to kind of realize that actually this kind of that digital revolution, whilst it kind of creates all sorts of opportunity online, it actually creates the offline, it, it, puts, the, it puts the offline world into perspective and it gives a validation to, to offline. And so, um, and so what you actually see is more people actually physically attending these things and, you know, by, by fronting up and, and, um, and debating these things in person is more powerful. Um, and then they will follow that up with social media. So it's not, it's like TV and radio, you know, radio didn't replace TV. Um, these things work alongside each other, but actually the, the kind of, um, I think what has happened for um, local politics is that um, being able to quickly disseminate information um, for people to be able to quickly pick up local news without having to have a local paper as well as the sun or the daily man or whatever it is they want to read. Um, that, you know, that, that they will engage. And then if there's something going on that they can find out about it on the day, you know, like before this webinar, webinar started, you know, I, I was able to kind of pop it out on, um, on Twitter and, and Facebook and, you know, in, um, before the digital, before the digital renaissance, before any of this stuff started, um, you wouldn't have been able to do that. And so I think, it's it's kind of breathing life into local politics but what doesn't work with local politics is is um representation it just doesn't work okay um we sort of come to the end of the time now and we could go on for forever and maybe we'll follow this up uh, some other time with another webinar and another event if that's okay with you emma because yeah. it's such a fascinating topic and people have a lot of questions and michelle's kind of going no i meant this oh. um I I sure. Yeah, go, yeah. I mean, do you want to say something about it no, now? We've still got a bit of time. Said, yeah, go on. Um, how can they overcome negative information, climate change, and not be overwhelmed by it to take meaningful democratic action? Yes, I yes, I see what you mean. I think it, uh, you know, it, it can be overwhelmed. But again, I think um, it's overwhelming if you haven't grown up in it. And this is why I think it's just so important to kind of remember this thing. It's just a part of their DNA. You know, they've grown up overwhelmed, put it that way. So um, does it all look like doom and gloom? Yes, you know, but, you know, they, they also know that their life is, is pretty much okay. You know, they, you know, they've, they've, um, they know that they're okay and they know how they're going to get through their life. So it's only how much they're actually going to accept from that. So kind of are they going to be overwhelmed with it? They are overwhelmed anyway, they just don't realize they are, I think is my answer to that. But um, how you translate that into making um, meaningful um, democratic action, that is the million dollar question. And that is where I think it will be interesting when those influencers start to get engaged with things that um, everybody else is gonna care about on the democratic stage. Okay, well that is a good point to stop 
to yeah, stop on really um, I mean there's still a few questions and we can't take them all because they often <laughs> they often come in an avalanche at the end um, mm. and uh, I mean Evan Park has talked about sortition lots of other things and we, we can deal with that we will deal with that again we talked about that in the previous webinar as well um, so I mean I think you've covered a huge amount of ground and so there's a lot more yet to be covered so mm, thank yeah. you Emma for doing that and you know we'll take this further and, and, and see how we can progress on this so I just want to um, thank everyone. Thank you all for joining us and uh, for taking part. Thank you for the, the 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 flow of questions, which have been many and and very interesting and very important as well. Um, the uh, webinar, as I said, will be recorded. I hope to get it out tomorrow to everyone so that you'll be able to see it. Um, and please put some comments on. We will put it on a site like Tremor as well so that people can engage in discussion around the webinar. We'll put it on our website so people can do that. We'll look at different ways we can do that. So that will be great. And can I say to those of you who are not members of Global Net 21, if you'd like to join us, please do. I will write to you about that. But um, we put on about 75 five events a year and it's a hell of an administrative job so any help you can give us um, that would be really appreciated because the work is, is, is quite strenuous so I hope you will anyhow thank you all for joining us and uh, thank you again Emma for everything you've done and for taking part it's been really really interesting and uh, we'd love to know how you get on in the future with uh, John Burko and with Parliament I will House. let you know what he says when after after I've seen him uh, after the summer but if any of you want to ask me questions just at me at Hubmum on Twitter who's um, easiest or email me or whatever okay so yeah if you do that to to Emma if you email any questions you've got and she will take it up and we'll try and take it up in other ways as well anyhow thank you all for taking part and uh, you know good night for this evening <laughs>